Good morning, everyone, to the Institute for Perinatal Quality Improvement PQI's Innovation Webinar. And today we are so honored to have Drs. Chop and Meadows here to present the Pinquin Speak Up and Birth Equity Journey. My name is Renee Byfield, and I am the Program Director for PQI Speak Up Implicit and Explicit Racial Biased Education. Again, welcome. Before we begin, I will be sharing a few slides with you regarding PQI and Speak Up. First of all, starting off with our mission, PQI's mission is to expand the use of improvement expand the use of improvement science to eliminate preventable perinatal morbidity and mortality and end perinatal racial and ethnic disparities. We are honored to have and appreciate the executive Adv advisory board, which Dr. Meadows is a member. We're also appreciative to our editorial advisory board. The members are on this page. And again, now I'll go over some updates. So Speak Up is more than an acronym. It's also a mnemonic. It is the foundation of our program. The whole program is based on quality improvement principles. Speak Up, as you know, is a journey, not a sprint. It takes a lot to dismantle racism. And to that end, most of our, all of our goals are focused. This is our action pathway, Speak Up Against Racism. And you can learn more about this on our webpage, www.perinatalqi.org. But the first step is that we want every perinatal professional and clinician to become Speak Up champions. We have quite a robust action-oriented list, steps one, two, and three, that will give a person a strong foundation to uh, working on dismantling racism. Then those who choose to do so can become ambassadors and eventually apply to become faculty. This page shows you exactly on our website where you can find our information about the program. There are many tools, valuable information and free resources, including the 28 day anti-racist challenge. And we're happy to say we have about 1200 people that have signed up to, uh, to perform the 28-day anti-racism challenge. During the month of February, in honor of Black History Month, we launched the 28-day anti-racism challenge. And it is not too late to register to obtain a daily email with opportunities to engage in reflection and action and to learn ways to dismantle racism. And today's quote is, and this is from Dr. Martin Luther King, Injustice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. So that's just a, um, a little example of what you, know, you learn each day in the um, challenge. We also have three uh, self-paced interactive modules that are actually a support and reinforce the education that we have in the champions course. It's about 30 to 35 minutes to complete all three, and they provide CNE and CMEs. We also have the ambassador course. Again, that's the next step after you complete the champion course. Um, and then you, when you've completed both, you are then eligible to apply to become faculty. We also have our PQI profiles, and this gives us an opportunity to feature different professionals in the country who are doing notable quality improvement work. We have several profiles, so we do, I do encourage you to check them out on our website. PQI is also working to decrease overuse of cesarean births. We know that this is a truck driver of severe maternal morbidity, and we also support freedom of movement and vaginal births. To that end, we have launched education on intermittent fetal auscultation and are engaging in initiatives around the use of intermittent auscultation. And here's the website for this education. Uh, you first are educated on how to perform intermittent auscultation, then we engage you in practice scenarios, actually five practice scenarios. 
So I want you to remember that quality improvement saves lives. Feel free to contact us via email at info at perinatalqi.org if you have any questions or suggestions. And now, without further ado, I'd like to in introduce our esteemed speakers. Dr. Jopp is the director of the Division of MCH Research and Analysis at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. She is the PI of the Massachusetts Perinatal Neonatal Quality Improvement Network, PINQUIN. Dr. Jopp is also the co-PI of the Maternal Mortality Study in Massachusetts. Her full bio um, is on the PQI website. And Dr. Meadows is a birth optimizer focused on ensuring positive pregnancy and birth experiences. As an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, she teaches medical students, residents, and fellows. For more than 15 years, she has been passionate about achieving health equity. Presently, she co-leads Pinquin. And for both full bios, you can access them on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And, and Rick, can everyone see my slides? Yes. Fantastic. So we're so excited to be here with you all to talk about the Pinquin Massachusetts Speak Up and Birth Equity journey. I just want to quickly review our learning objectives today. We'd love for you to leave here understanding the national and state data that highlights the need to focus on equity, especially in our quality improvement efforts toward maternal health. We also wanna highlight the partnerships that we've developed in Massachusetts with our Department of Public Health, the um, AWAN, the Association of Women's Health Obstetric Ner Neonatal Nurses, and our state PQC, all to drive maternal equity action. We'll introduce the Penquin Massachusetts Birth Equity Journey, what is our AIM initiative, and also outline some of the partnerships and strategies that we worked toward improving maternal outcomes especially to eliminate racial inequities. My disclosures are that I'm a consultant with PQI and IHI, and I'm also, as Renee said, a member of, of PQI's advisory board. Without further ado, I'd love to turn this over to my esteemed colleague who is the founder of our state PQC and the person that drives all the work forward in the state of Massachusetts for maternal health action, Dr. Fifi Jopp. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meadows. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to talk about how we are addressing maternal health inequities in Massachusetts. I have nothing to disclose. Next slide, please. Let me start with some definitions so we are all on the same page about what uh, language we commonly use. In Massachusetts, we use the definition recommended by the Maternal Mortality Study Group, a national group jointly shared by the Division of Reproductive Health at the CDC and ACOG. The Maternal Mortality Study Group uses the term pregnancy associated instead of maternal to reflect the inclusion of deaths occurring during pregnancy. As such, the definition of pregnancy associated death is the death of a woman or a pregnant person while pregnant or within one year of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of the cause. Pregnancy associated deaths are divided into three categories. The first category is pregnancy related, which is the death of a person while pregnant or within one year of termination of pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by her pregnancy or its management, but not accidental or incidental causes. For example, under this definition is a death of a person from postpartum hemorrhage or amniotic fluid embolism. The second category is pregnancy associated but not related, which is a death of a person while pregnant or within one year of termination of pregnancy due to a cause unrelated to pregnancy. For example, the death of a woman from motor vehicle collision. And the third category is pregnancy associated, but undetermined if pregnancy related, which is the death of a person while pregnant or within one year of termination of pregnancy 
from a cause that cannot be determined or conclusively categorized as either pregnancy related or not pregnancy related. For example, a person dies at six months postpartum from a self-inflected cause with an unknown mental health history. Next slide, please. Pregnancy-related deaths are rare but key sentinel event that are often used to characterize maternal health. Pregnancy-related deaths used in combination with other data can create a stronger narrative. Next slide, please. Historically, the US has been doing worse than any other industrialized countries ranking last by a wide margin across this 100 year period. As shown here, Norway went from 290 per 100,000 live births in the first decade of the 20th century to 245 deaths by 1927 and down to two per 100,000 in 2017, which is remarkable. As for the US, the ratio only decreased from 650 to 647 between 1910 and 1927. And the US had a ratio of 20 per 100,000 live births in 2017, which is unacceptable for one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Next slide, please. Among the countries listed in the most recent WHO report on maternal mortality, the US ranks about 56 between Russia and Oman. This should be a major embarrassment to the US. However, care should be taken when making country comparisons on maternal mortality since except in very large impoverished countries, maternal death will be relatively rare less than one in 1,000. So ratios can fluctuate widely. As noted in this slide, the countries in green in this figure have fewer than 100,000 births a year. What if we did a, a more reasonable comparison? Let's examine comparably wealthy countries with at least 300,000 births annually and see where the US stands. Next slide, please. Um, even among countries that have few, that have more than 300,000 births annually, the U.S. still lags behind, as shown here. Next slide, please. One rationalization used to explain the poor U.S. performance is that we are a more diverse society than our comparison countries. However, as the figure illustrates here, even if we limit the US data to just white non-Hispanic, the US would still rank last by a wide margin. That's not to underestimate the profound racial inequities in US maternal death, but it does suggest that there are more systemic factors underlying the poor US performance. Next slide, please. This slide shows maternal mortality ratios for black and white. While mortality ratios have significantly continued to decline in other wealthy countries, the ratios in the US continue to increase as shown on this slide. Just between 2018 and 2019, the ratio went from 17.4 per 100,000 live births to 20.1 per 100,000 live births. In 2019, as shown here, the maternal mortality ratio for black non-Hispanic was 44 per 100,000 live births, which is 2.5 times the ratio of white at 17.9 per 100,000 live births, and is also 3.5 times the rate of Hispanic women at 12.6, which is not shown here. Next slide, please. 
Here in Massachusetts, in our state, pregnancy associated mortality ratios fluctuated from a low of 28 to a high of 40 per 100,000 live births between 1998 and 2019. While the ratios increased during this time period, the annual percentage change was not significant. Next slide, please. Since our pregnancy-related mortality ratios were always low, for the past several decades, before even we joined AIM, in Massachusetts, we've been looking at near-miss events or severe maternal morbidity, which is defined by the CDC as unexpected outcomes of labor and delivery, such as hemorrhage, embolism, acute renal failure, stroke, acute myocardial infections, and other severe complications that result in significant short-term or long-term consequences to a woman's health. SMM is estimated to be 50 to 100 times more common than maternal death, and racial inequities in SMM exist, with Black women having a 70% greater risk of SMM. Next slide, please. Shown here are the conditions that define SMM20 when blood transfusion is included, and SMM21 when blood transfusion is not included. Next slide. This slide shows that while the rates of SMM20 during this 10 year period increased for all race ethnic groups in Massachusetts, black people experienced the greatest absolute increase compared to any other race ethnic group. The rate for black in 2018 remains higher than the rate of any other race ethnic group in 2009 suggesting that they did not benefit from improved medical knowledge or technology during the last decade. This finding is important in a state where a healthcare reform law was passed in 2006 with the overarching goal of improving health insurance to practically, the, the overarching, I'm sorry, of providing health insurance to practically all residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And a state that has the best teaching hospitals and highly qualified providers. As we see here, the lines for all other race and ethnic groups are intertwined, clustered together, suggesting that other race ethnic groups are treated more or less the same way. The fact that the line for black is a flying high above is very telling and validates what we know about how black birthing people are mistreated by a racially biased healthcare system. Next slide. I want to switch gears here and talk about PRAMS, Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, and how we use the PRAMS to highlight inequities in health outcomes in Massachusetts. But before I talk about PRAMS, I want to provide some context. Current state and national data systems lack the ability to highlight the drivers of inequities across populations. States and programs collect race ethnicity data which are incomplete, not disaggregated enough, and do not tell a complete story about how racism, discrimination, stigma, and bias have contributed to the adverse outcome we see among black and brown people. PRAMS is one of our major surveillance systems and is funded by CDC. The goal of PRAMS is to provide data to improve maternal and infant outcomes. PRAMS inquires about maternal attitudes, behaviors before, during, and after pregnancy. Massachusetts implemented PRAMS in 2007. Unique to Massachusetts, we oversample by race ethnicity to ensure adequate representation of racial ethnic minority groups. What that means is that when we, over, we sample, um, while there are only 9% of uh, black birthing people in the state, if we oversample 600 white, we also, if we sample 600 white, we also sample 600 blacks, we also sample 600 Hispanic, which is extremely important from a data standpoint because it's a step 
that allows to collect more granular data and ensure that we are hearing from all postpartum people. Massachusetts was also the first prime state to include questions related to racism and discrimination on its survey. Currently, there are 23 PRAMS sites across the country that ask some type of racism and discrimination questions. Also, for a long time, Massachusetts was the only, was one of two, only two states that included disability status on its survey. Next slide, please. As stated, we explicitly asked about racism and how it increases risk stress particularly among Black people who give birth in the state. As shown here, Black people are more likely to report that racism contributed to their stress level, that they were emotionally upset and had physical symptoms based on the way they were treated. Not surprisingly, they were constantly thinking about race. If people are constantly thinking about their race, how can they be productive at work or anywhere? How do they feel getting care or asking for help when they need it? Next slide. This slide shows how racism is or being discriminated against can increase your stress by education level. While for white people, stress level decreases as education level increases, for black people, it's the other way around. The more educated you are, which is a proxy for better income, the higher your stress level. This is an important slide, and we've used it to explain that for Black people, the social determinants of health don't really matter. They still get mistreated and stigmatized wherever they go. Next slide. We've also learned from our PRAMS data that Black who are US born fare worse than those who are non US born. It has been long suggested that the effect of racial discrimination accumulates over time, over the life course, which is known as the weathering effect. Black people born here are likely more affected by racism because of the amount of time they are exposed to it in the US. Next slide, please. Mental health, such as postpartum depression, is more pre prevalent among people who experience racism, which is due to the level of toxic stress they experience on a daily basis. As shown here, people who experience racism are twice as likely to report postpartum depressive symptoms. Next slide, please. This graph clearly shows the large gap between rates of postpartum depressive symptoms among Black compared to white. Between 2009 and 2011, PRAMS asked a different set of questions to identify postpartum depressive symptoms, but those questions were thought to be greatly an underestimate of the prevalence of postpartum depressive symptoms. You can see here that although the prevalence has declined a bit over the past eight years, Black consistently reports postpartum depressive symptoms more than twice as frequently as white. One other thing I want to point out here is that is the fact that while the rates for white are better than the rate for black, they are still experiencing a fairly high prevalence of uh, postpartum depressive symptoms ranging from over time from 6.4 to 10.6%. Nobody is doing well here is the message. Uh, next slide, please. So the next set of slides show that people giving birth who report experiencing racism also experience each type of stress group, stressor group, more than those who don't report experiencing racism. Partner related stress is nearly twice the prevalence among people giving birth who report experiencing racism compared to those who don't. Next slide. Among PRAMS responded who reported experiencing racism, 66% also reported financial stress. That's two thirds of this group. Trauma related stress is also nearly twice the prevalence among people giving birth 
who report experiencing racism compared to those who don't. Next slide, please. At the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, we have now long recognized that while Massachusetts is consistently among the 10 healthiest states in the country, underneath that accomplishment, we know that racial and ethnic inequities exist and have persisted for decades despite our efforts to improve outcomes. Shown here in this slide is our so-called DPH house, which provides the framework for our programs based on three key strategies, data, determinants, and disparities. We aim to provide timely access to data to address the social determinant of health and eliminate institutional and structural racism in all our programs and healthcare systems. Next slide, please. In 2019, the Department of Public Health convened a cross-bureau collaborative team, including staff from Title V, the Office of Health Equity, and the Office of Program Management and Quality Improvement to create a racial equity data roadmap. This was done in response to a need identified by staff and programs around the lack of capacity to collect and use data for explicit action to promote racial equity. So the roadmap was developed by MDPH as a tool to improve use of data for action to promote racial equity in MDPH funded programs and initiatives, including hospitals, provide suggested methodology to assess progress in addressing racial inequities in service delivery and health outcomes, and collect guiding questions, tools, and resources that can be customized to best suit the needs of programs with different levels of capacity in data. This slide shows an overview of the different stops along the roadmap. You can see that it is separated into seven sections, applying a racial equity reframe, assessing program readiness to use a racial equity data reframe, disaggregating data and assessing for inequities, contextualizing data, prioritizing strategies, developing an equity spotlight and highlight the data, to highlight the data, moving from data to action. The idea here is that there are multiple entry points to the roadmap, so different programs or institutions may start at different places. We have piloted different sections of the roadmap using our home visiting programs. Next slide. Call to action. Next slide. To move from data to action, a multi-sectorial collaboration is needed and action is required at multiple levels, including healthcare systems, community, and policy. Next slide. Data, including personal stories, are also needed to highlight inequities and to point to action. Next slide. Finally, building partnerships is key when doing equity work. While many people don't agree, it is important to recognize that equity is everyone's business, as well as because we all have a role to play. DPH at the Department of Public Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health has established strong partnerships with the state PQC, our pin queen, and has supported uh, the collaborative with federal and state dollars to implement safety bundles, provide uh, stigma, implicit and explicit bias trainings, support the development of equity dashboard to build a culture of equity within the healthcare systems. We have also been partnering with uh, PQI to provide speak up trainings, which were originally targeted uh, toward nursing staff, but now open to other providers, including our maternal mortality review committee members and other public health professionals. And I think this is the end of my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Jean de Clerc for sharing some of his slides with me. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Meadows now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Job. I'll move forward into talking more about those partnerships that Dr. Job discussed with the MassDPH. And that is the partnership with our state perinatal quality collaborative for Massachusetts, 
Most people have heard that term is PQCs. Ours is called the perinatal neonatal. We are a life course organization, so focusing on mom and baby. We're the perinatal neonatal quality improvement network of Massachusetts. And one of the center, central uh, tenets of our organization is moving toward a culture of equity. We've been intentional in the work that we do as a PQC. I'd like to quote Dr. Fathala, the past president of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, that when it comes to maternal mortality, so maternal death, women are not dying because of diseases we cannot treat. They are dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. And so with that, I recommend that we're always intentional of our work as we move forward. And the intention we've taken is stated in our mission statement for our PQC. We have four areas. Quality improvement is what we do, promotion of best practices, open sharing of data, and collaborative learning. And what we focus on is achieving measurable improvements in perinatal health outcomes while eliminating health disparities and achieving health equity for moms, newborns, and families in Massachusetts. We've been on a birth equity journey that began somewhere around 2016, if not before, in tandem and in partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. When we established our PQC as an organization, we established ourselves as an equity-based organization through our mission statement. We've partnered with our Massachusetts Department of Public Health in working towards shifting a culture of equity through raising awareness. And this comes from many of the uh, programs that we'd put on between 2016 and forward and the projects and initiatives we implemented, focusing on equity and focusing on data to get to equity. We also in 2019 joined the National AIM program, which is a national call to action to address these egregious rising rates of maternal morbidity and mortality in our country, especially compared to other countries as Dr. Jopp showed. With that, we're also focusing on launching that with an equity focus. In 2020, we began to address racial inequities through measurement. As we launched our AIM initiative, we worked with our birthing hospitals to provide, um, we worked with our birthing hospitals and another state agency, the Betsy Lehman Center, to provide information on each hospital's SMM. So that's the severe maternal morbidity illness that Dr. Jopp discussed. And we did that by stratifying a race ethnicity and the data that we shared with those teams to help engage them in the work that we were moving toward. We also have worked toward racism and bias upstander training for our teams and staff. We've partnered with IPQI or PQI, the Perinatal Quality Institute, to engage our OB providers in the Speak Up Against Racism training to help build that culture of equity. We're also driving that equity action forward by pairing data with QI action. I'll give our example here. We address what we measure. So I want people to walk away from remembering that statement because if you're not measuring by race, ethnicity and by other areas of equity, for instance, geography or language, then you're not gonna be able to address those populations. We address what we measure. Within our Massachusetts AIM initiative launched, as I said, in 2019, we particularly focused first on the obstetric care for women with opioid use disorder bundle. That is because our data, as Dr. Jopp showed, showed an increase and maternal deaths related to pregnancy associated death from opioid use disorder and overdose. We also have the severe hypertension and pregnancy bundle that we're, that we're in the process of engaging teens in, in the moment from January to June of this year. And we'd recently completed our obstetric hemorrhage bundle. Moving forward, we'll also have structure, process and outcome measures related to a reduction of peripartum and racial and ethnic disparities bundle, and that will come in September of 2022. And none of this is done without our partnerships. Uh, we've partnered with many organizations across the state and across the country to shape, frame, and advise our work. As we kicked off our AIM initiative in 2019, we did so with an equity focus, and we had a panel on achieving health equity that was led and moderated by our, doctor, by, by our very own Dr. Job and others in our state, Dr. Bryant, Dr. Balanoff, um, and Dr. Joy Kerr Perry came to join us from the National Birth Equity Collaborative, and also maternal health advocates like Ms. Saba, who's been helpful in moving Penquin's work forward. So we're guiding this conversation in our state. This is also a national conversation on equity and the impact of racism and bias on the status of women, care for women, and outcomes, and I should say birthing individuals. 
this is a screenshot of what comes with every email and every um, communication from the national, the American College of OBGYN. This states addressing racism and changing the culture of medicine that they express in solidarity that they wanna to work together along with the other 18 organizations of ACOG to have a collective action plan outlining steps to champion alongside the community uh, organizations in obstetric and gynecology, how we would address racism. This is the joint statement that was published in the summer of 2020, August of 2020. And I wanna highlight the second paragraph where this is very important, especially in the practice of medicine and the training of future physicians and um, midwifery folks and uh, other obstetric nursing, um, midwives, I'm sorry, I already said midwives, but doulas is what I was gonna say. Recognizing that race is a social construct, not biologically based, is important to understanding that it is racism, not race, that impacts healthcare, health, and health outcomes. It's very important because we often will talk about race and we talk about stratifying our data by race ethnicity. That is not because we're expecting to find a difference in data and in difference in outcomes based on biology because of race. We're looking for differences, but we know those differences are based in differences of experience for different racial groups in our society and experiences for different racial groups within our healthcare system. This is a graphic from the, this very own IPQI, the Perinatal Quality Improvement um, Institute, as we have worked with our teams to help them apply uh, a lens of equity by understanding the difference between equality and equity. Oftentimes we hear in common media and lay media that there's a dis description of equality and folks think, well, that's what we're going for. When we talk about equality, there is an assumption that everyone benefits from the same or equal support. And that's not the case. There are other supports and there are other actions and activities that we could put in place as a healthcare system. And we're aware of that. And that is the practice of equity. So as you see the boxes to the, on your screen to the left of the birthing individuals, we can use those supports and resources to offer what every individual needs to attain their full health potential. And that is equity. We've also had support in our work from public policy as we've moved forward as a PQC to address racial and ethnic disparities and to think about what are those strategies and actions to achieve equity. We worked with a number of other maternal health advocates and birth maternal health organizations within Massachusetts to draft and what was passed was a bill in 2020 called an act to reduce racial disparities in maternal health. This legislated and put into law that the state of Massachusetts created a commission for a number of leaders to put together thoughts and recommendations on how we could counteract and address issues related to race and racism as it pertains to maternal health and birth outcomes. And as Dr. Jopp mentioned in the call to action, this looks at areas related to policy, community and family engagement, as well as what's happening in our public health infrastructure. So I like to bring, um, our portion to a close by ending here with an ode to Isabel Wilkerson, who's the author of a novel cast, if others have read that. And this is an expression of gratitude actually to all of you on this call, especially those who are in this work of caring for birthing individuals and babies, infants and families across the country. And so I'm grateful to you for all that you do because it all comes together in the end for all of us and everyone benefits when our focus is equity, when we focus on giving others what they need to attain their health status. Um, this on the left, the, the house that looks dilapidated, this, this house is our house of maternal health care and outcomes. It was built decades ago and it requires continuous work. None of us was here when it was built, though we are heir to whatever is right or wrong with it. And to offer protection from consequences of inaction, we must work within our own transformational spaces, whether that be within administration, researcher investigation, clinical practice, continuous improvement from QI, identification of best practices, public health, all of the areas that we can work within. So to make it more of an analogy towards a house, if your role as a plumber, you're gonna be in the plumbing areas. 
If your role is related to windows, you're going to be in the areas where you're helping with windows. And similar within our healthcare system, we all play individual and different roles. But together, we can achieve optimal systems of care and experiences for everyone and have an achievement of a maternal care um, and outcomes home that we see to our right. So in summary, as we all work within our own transformational spaces and as we do so with a, within Penquin as a PQC, um, I would offer first be intentional, make the decision that this work is worth doing. And I saw a question in the chat earlier from someone that asked about addressing um, high cesarean births. And so when you're working with leadership and folks have become intentional, and then we also have that fund of knowledge of knowing what was shared also in the chat, which is the AIM safety bundle for safe reduction of primary cesarean births. And so you have this information, you have a scaffolding, you have an infrastructure you can bring forward. Really lean in and maximize those partnerships as we've done with PQI, A1, our state data center, the Betsy Lehman Center, um, our state DPH. Working together with those partnerships also helps to raise awareness and raising awareness among your constituents. With that, begin to shift that culture toward equity. We cannot continue to do the same thing that we've been doing and expect a different outcome because that's not what's gonna happen. We have to shift. And with that, we use our data to identify those inequities. So when you're looking at data for outcomes for birthing individuals in your healthcare system, particularly let's use the example again of cesarean, I would offer that you'd wanna look at that data. You wanna see what your cesarean rates are by providers, um, by shift change, by um, race and ethnicity, by geography, where folks are coming from, any way that you can begin to slice your, your data, identify where there are areas where the cesarean rates go up. So you use your data to identify those challenges. You use your data to identify racial inequities. And with that, you then wanna pair your data with action. And the reason why I'm a big fan of working within the quality improvement space is because built within QI and inherent to that, is a focus on sustainability and a focus on helping others restructure and change just a bit the way we all do business so that we can continue a continuous process of improvement and continue to head in the direction that we wanna go in. So with that, I wanna say thank you and turn our attention to taking additional questions um, from those in the audience and to say thank you for being here as well. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I am going to share with you a few of the questions that have been populated. So this says, um, how do you explain the slide related to correlation between education and stress for black individuals? I'll start to answer that, then I will turn it over to Dr. Jopp. Oh, actually I see Dr. Jopp's unmuted. Go ahead, Dr. Jopp. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, it's a very, it's an interesting one. Um, there is a tendency to think that the social determinants of health equal racism. The reality is the social determinants of health in a normal world when there is no racism can improve health. It means that when you have high education, you have, um, good social determinants of health, your health is good. But in America, that's not the case. It doesn't matter. If you're a black person, whether you're educated, whether you're rich does not matter. Your health outcomes are always worse because of the level of discrimination that you, uh, you experience on a daily basis. Every day on an average day, a black person is subject to um, discrimination on an average three times a day. And what that does is to create a level of toxic stress mentally and emotionally. So there was, um, in the healthcare setting, when you talk about uh, inequities and outcomes, what you hear providers say, but it's the social determinants of health. They're not doing well because they're poor. They live in a poor neighborhood. Um, they live in you know, a neighborhood that is disadvantaged. But the reality is that neighborhood is the result of structural racism like redlining. You don't just live in a place because you want to. People are born where they're born. And when we say you know, place matters, where you live will determine what you have access to, will determine 
um, the, the built environment to allow you to exercise or do other things. So education is not the solution for black people. You may be educated, you may be um, wealthy, you will still be discriminated. And I'm gonna give myself or Dr. Meadows as an example. It doesn't matter what I know about OB as a trained obstetrician gynecologist. When I walk in the healthcare system, they treat me like I know nothing. They don't allow me to express myself and talk about what I know about my body or what I know about you know, the societal impact of racism. So it's really just a saying that it's not your education or your, you know, your social determinants of health. It's really your experience as a person. The, the way you've been treated, the way you've been stigmatized is, lead, is what is leading to your stress level. And what is interesting is that stress level um, becomes higher for women who are educated because there is more pressure on you to you know, be in a place to do more than others, to be sort of respected, you have to do more and more and more. And the price you're paying is your stress level, your high blood pressure, your uh, cardiac condition, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what is um, compounded into that slide. And I'm, I hope that's helpful. If not, please unmute and tell me your thoughts. Thank you so much. Dr. Meadows, did you want to add anything? Sure, I will mm -hmm. add to that. Uh, in, in receiving my training uh, in the public health field, I learned that increasing one's income and education level would increase and improve one's health status. And many people have seen that as true, as an example. And to what Dr. Drop says, I just want to underscore everything I'm saying is just underscoring what she's saying, which is for Black women that hasn't been, and for Black populations that had not been the case, and, and a good example of that also is the, the gestational age. So we're talking here about maternal death and maternal illness at the time of delivery, but the gestational age of delivery. So preterm births are higher among women who identify as African-American or black. And with that higher levels of education and income don't improve those rates and don't remove the, the risk that's inherent there. Um, and when we think about um, that, it's quite striking. I remember when that data was published by Dr. David Jones, uh, who looked at that and really showed that when it comes to thinking about the differences in outcomes um, for Black individuals when it comes to birth and maternal care, the differences are more related to race and racism. Thank you so much. And the next question is, is the neighborhood birth center connected to your efforts? I'm really glad you asked that question, Tracy. We are big fans and big supporters. The state PQC does not have a formal relationship with the leader of the Neighborhood Birth Center. I'm, I know her very well, I'm just not saying her name. Um, and in having that relationship, we're very supportive. And so when we've had conversations within the state maternal commission to address inequities in Massachusetts that I showed was the, the law that recently got passed, we have pushed forward to help include in our recommendations um, the issue related to ha uh, having these independent birth centers in the communities and showing the data that shows where those can be helpful for both experiences and outcomes of pregnancy. So thank you for asking that. I wanna elevate and, and really um, congratulate all the wonderful work that's moved forward in Massachusetts due to the leadership of the Neighborhood Birth Center. Thank you so much. Dr. Job, did you wanna add anything to that before we move forward to the next question? No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Next question. Can you speak a little bit about the medical medicalization of labor and the bias that more interventions equal better care? Mm. That's a really good question, Pamela. Um, you know, when I think about the interventions that um, equal better care, I actually think of the interventions not of the ones you may be referencing, and I'm thinking sort of in the opposite direction, interventions that are further upstream that lead to actual better, better care and are the opposite of additional medicalization of pregnancy and delivery, and that would be group prenatal care. Um, so with that, we under uh, utilize, we, we don't want to over utilize medicines, we don't want to under utilize medicine. And in my experience, a, a space that we found a very nice lane that allows people to be pregnant, which is not a disability, not a disease state, but a very healthy, natural, normal process for many people. 
that can have medical conditions associated, that if we're able to allow um, those individuals to be together and talk about their, their needs and their wants, desires, um, and supports of each other through the pregnancy experience while having a circle of safety of those in the medical field to uh, risk reduce, uh, health promote, and observe, and then and intervene when we need to, we see that we have better outcomes. We utilize the medical care system less, we utilize cesarean births less, and people are happier with their care. And so I agree that medicalization of over medicalization of any stage within the pregnancy phase, whether it's outpatient or on the labor and delivery unit, is over medicalization. And that we also don't want to underutilize because we want to make sure that folks are safe. We have seen in that slide that Dr. Jopp showed earlier on that from the early 2000s, I'm sorry, early 1900s forward, we have improved outcomes for women and birthing individuals um, with the introduction of care in the hospital system. However, when we've gone too far and over medicalized, it does not lead to better outcomes. So thank you for that question. Dr. Job. I, I just wanted to add that if uh, um, it is related to doing adequate and appropriate screenings multiple times, for example, getting colonoscopies as painful as that can be, then it is a good thing. But in the space of equity, what we see is that good best standard of care and practices and prevention happens in white, among white people and not necessarily other people. When it comes to complications related to um, pregnancy, for example, um, excess C-sections, that tends to happen among black and brown people. So there is a nuance there uh, in terms of what amount, what level, what amount of um, medicalization is needed versus that isn't. Of course, we all agree that, you know, based on WHO's definitions, C-sections below 15% are okay. But when you're in a state like Massachusetts, where in some hospitals, the rates of C-sections are uh, more than 50% of the patient are sections. It ranging from you know 32% to 58% C-section rate. That is something that we have to be um, sort of looking at more in depth and trying to understand why that's happening. So you know, it's there is a balance. We have to think about a balance. There is so much into it. But thank you so much for raising that question. Thank you so much for your responses. We have two more questions. Um, as a retired obstetrician, I have observed how entrenched OB's attitudes are and how most whites, especially doctors, they don't know about racism and, and I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, and obstetrics and are in denial of their own biases. How is this being addressed in Massachusetts? Does Speak Up work there? I would love to say yes. Because, and what I, why I say that is exactly why we're here. We have partnered with the Speak Up Against Racism program to bring that information. And I, I'll actually take even a step, a little step back farther um, in that question, which is I'm actually now in California at the University of California in San Diego and working in the medical school here. This needs to be taught farther upstream with the medical schools. Actually, I would argue with an undergraduate um, education and courses. We need to understand as a country how racism is a very defining issue on the soil of America in many sectors, not just the healthcare sector. And with that, with racism and paternalism that plays out in, in, in healthcare, and it can, and it doesn't everywhere, but it does predominantly in, in a number of locations, we wanna make sure we continue to raise awareness. I bring up California also to say that in this state, there was a bill passed in the Senate that required now that all perinatal care providers train in obstetric racism. And there have been many different um, training um, programs, I should say, and opportunities made available to OB care providers. And it's not just the obstetrician or the midwife, it's also the nurses and other people, anyone who works within the NICUs, within the with the babies, with the moms, uh, with families. Are, are being required to do this training. This is very important because we're raising awareness as we talked about in our Massachusetts birth equity journey, raise awareness, raise awareness, raise awareness, and then do that also in a very um, synchronous and asynchronous fashion so folks have time to think within themselves, 
um, what that means for them and be on their own journey toward understanding equity, as well as work with others to have those conversations and think about what those equity actions can then look like. I, I wanted to add that there was a paper published today. It was released today in the New England Journal of Medicine called Racial Biology and Medical Misconception um, based on research that Dr. Huffman had done documenting that racial misconception held by medical students and residents is um, leading to some of the biases we see once they become practitioners. I would encourage you to read it. Um, I can drop it in the chat box for anyone who wants to take a look at it. Very powerful. And there's also the question that you also asked, Leslie, around this, the option for out of hospital birth and culturally congruent care with black midwives. And is that being promoted in Massachusetts? I would say the answer for me is yes. How widely promoted and how, how much others have heard this um, uh, we don't have data or information on. Um, there, there are multiple groups, um, maternal, maternal advocates, um, maternal health organizations within Massachusetts that are speaking about this and, and working with other groups to help understand what are the goals and needs of black birthing individuals and how they're seeking culturally congruent care and how those needs can be met. So that conversation is happening. Um, where we are in the conversation in terms of moving towards more action, I can't answer, but, but yes, it is. Dr. Job. Do you have anything to add about the out of hospital birth and culturally congruent care with black midwives in Massachusetts? No, I mean, I would like to add that we are uh, considering doing more work with doulas in the state, um, bringing the doulas as part of the care team. And our Medicaid program has agreed or has expressed interest in uh, covering for doula services in the next coming um, months. So we are thinking about it as a way of having doulas be the voices of the patient they care for and support them um, around, you know, getting less uh, C-section, for example, when not needed and uh, giving them a choice as to where they want to deliver and how they want their care to be handled. So we are moving in that direction. And we are also considering including doulas uh, in, as a part of our maternal mortality review committee team so that when we review uh, maternal or pregnancy associated death, we can get their insight on what might have contributed and how racism might have contributed to the death. Thank you so much for that response. And just a time check, we have two more minutes. I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's see, uh, how can we move forward addressing racism in the United States with the current political climate? I think the first step is to uh, have an open line of communication. We need to have these conversations. We need to normalize these conversations because the tendency is anytime we talk about race or racism, uh, people get turned off. Nobody wants to have these conversations. And I think uh, we should begin those conversations and we should um, talk about it you know, in partnerships, built in partnerships is key. Like I said, we all have a role to play. The providers do what they do to prevent SMM from happening or managing SMM in the healthcare setting, but then they send women to the community. We have to be able to understand uh, programs that exist in the communities like home visiting programs and other community-based programs and how they also play a role in supporting women in the communities and finding women early before they hit the healthcare system, recognizing that pregnancy is just a short period of time and a lot happens before you go into care. Um, so, you know, moving the conversation, thinking about addressing the upstream factors, not the distal factors, not the outcomes is 
where we should be going and having policies like uh, requiring explicit and implicit bias trainings for providers, for example, is a concrete action step. Um, building a medical a curriculum on racism and racial equities in the medical schools is another way. Those are really concrete ways you can begin the conversation. The paradigm shift should happen early before people are in uh, the workforce when they're still in medical school, when they're doing the residency. And um, it's not something that should be from the top down or bottom up. It should be really um, from all of us. Thank you again, speakers. Thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. And um, thank you all for attending. We're so appreciative of you. And uh, the session is now over. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for attending.